Hello and welcome back to Zoology 141. Today we're going to look at the central nervous system, specifically the brain. After you complete today's lecture, you should be able to describe the embryonic development of the central nervous system, including the brain and spinal cord. You should be able to describe the anatomy and function of the meninges and cerebral spinal fluid. You should be able to describe the function of the blood-brain barrier and be familiar with the anatomy and function of the major brain regions. This is the major learning outcome for today. You should also be able to describe the sequence of neural processing of sensory information as it comes into the brain from sensory neurons and is processed by various regions of the cerebral cortex. You should also be able to differentiate between declarative and non-declarative memory and also describe the process of memory formation. And finally, you should be familiar with the causes and treatments for select diseases of the brain and spinal cord. And these are listed at the end of the lecture. We're not going to go through all of these diseases, but there is discussions of each one in your textbook. So the functions of the brain are quite numerous, and they include registering sensations and processing these sensations. It includes the storing of information, such as memories. And the brain also oversees the running of automatic body systems. And this would be things like the autonomic nervous system that runs your heart rate, your respiration rate, uh, controls your blood pressure, body temperature, and so on. And of course, the brain is very important for making decisions and taking appropriate action. Let's say you see a car speeding towards you as you're in a crosswalk. You're obviously going to jump out of the way and uh, avoid collision with that car. And all of these actions are part of the thinking and integration properties of the brain, as well as the motor functions as well. Because remember, the brain controls skeletal muscle contraction. And finally, the brain is the center for intellect, emotions, behavior, personality, and memory. And we'll talk about each of these in some detail. Now the brain is divided into four major regions. The cerebrum, which you see here highlighted in orange, is the most advanced and developed part of the brain. This is where intellect and reasoning and personality are located, but it's also where we process sensory information coming in, and also this is where we generate action potentials or nerve impulses that control our skeletal muscles. The other parts of the brain include the diencephalon, which include the thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus, the cerebellum, and finally the brainstem. The lower three parts of the brain are sort of part of our automatic brain. Uh, we're not consciously aware of most of what's going on in these parts of the brain. The majority of your conscious awareness tends to be isolated or limited to the cerebral cortex. Now before we talk about the functions of the brain, we need to talk a little bit about how the brain and spinal cord are formed during the embryonic period. Remember the embryonic period is the first few weeks of development of a baby, which will start out as an embryo and eventually become a fetus, and then when it's born, a neonate. And so in the first few days of embryonic development, we have formation of something called the neural tube, and the neural tube will form the brain and spinal cord. Now the neural tube starts out as a plate of ectoderm. Ectoderm is a type of tissue that will become nervous tissue, but it'll also become epithelial tissue. Now underneath this ectoderm plate is a rod that's called the notochord. The notochord is a primitive cartilaginous rod. It's sort of like a primitive backbone for the developing embryo. And signals emanate from the notochord, which induce the neural plate to sort of fold up like a taco or a hide -a bed if this folding goes correctly, the two sides of the neural groove will unite to form a complete neural tube. At this point, the neural tube will then be covered over with fresh ectoderm in the form of an epidermis. And the solid parts of the neural tube will become the solid parts of the brain and spinal cord. And the hollow parts of the neural tube will become the hollow parts of the brain and spinal cord. Now, once formed, that neural tube will begin to differentiate into different brain regions. First of all, we'll start out with three divisions, the prosencephalon, the mesencephalon, and the rhombencephalon. The prosencephalon will continue to differentiate into the telencephalon, which will become the cerebral cortex, and the diencephalon, which will become the thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus. The middle part, or mesencephalon, will become the midbrain, and the rhombencephalon will become the brain stem, which includes the pons and the medulla oblongata. The rhombencephalon will also become the cerebellum. 
Now the process of neurulation or forming that neural tube and differentiating into different brain regions is actually quite a complex process and sometimes errors do occur. As a result of some of these errors we can get a condition called spinal bifida. Spinal bifida is a condition in which the neural tube fails to close completely during embryonic development. As a result, the lamina of the vertebrae are not fully formed and the fetus can be born with a lesion in its back uh, through which neural tissue is exiting or a hydrocele that surrounds the spinal cord. And oftentimes spinal bifida does result in some sort of motor impairment. The other condition that's much more drastic but also much more rare is something called anencephaly. Anencephaly literally means without a head or without a brain. So this is a condition in which the forebrain that is formed degenerates because the cranial bones have not fully formed during the embryonic and fetal period. As a result, uh, the majority of the brain tissue is literally eaten away in utero. Now problems with neurulation can be not entirely prevented, but we can reduce the chances of having incomplete closure of the neural tube by supplementing folic acid uh, during the period of embryonic development. Okay, before we go on to talk about the different parts of the brain, I just want to say something about the blood supply to the brain. So arterial blood is supplied to the brain from the carotid arteries and also the vertebral arteries. And the brain, as it happens, is a very metabolically expensive organ. It needs a lot of energy and a lot of oxygen. Now this energy comes primarily from glucose, which is a monosaccharide. Now even though you may not be getting a lot of glucose in your diet, let's say you're on the Atkins diet and just getting proteins and fat, uh, your body can convert those nutrients into glucose through gluconeogenesis to make sure that we have adequate amounts of glucose to the brain. Now, the brain can also metabolize ketones to some extent, but for the most part, glucose does tend to be the preferred energy source. Now, the interesting thing about the brain is the blood flow is adjustable, and as you begin to use one area of the brain, let's say you're thinking about something in your prefrontal cortex, we will divert proportionally more blood and more oxygen to that part of the brain. So there's various imaging techniques we can use to look at brain activity, and the way that they do this is they look at the blood flow to different regions of the brain. Now because the brain doesn't have any myoglobin, it can't store oxygen, it also doesn't store much in the way of nutrients. And so deprivation of blood flow or oxygen for even a few minutes can lead to permanent brain injury. Now you're probably already aware that the brain is probably the most essential organ in the body. It maintains the rest of the body through the autonomic nervous system and it also directs the contraction of skeletal muscle through our somatic nervous system. And so we really want to make sure that our brain is well protected. We have a very nice cranium that's surrounding our brain, including the frontal bones, parietal bones, and also the occipital bone. Now underneath those bones we'll find a protective covering which are called the meninges. The meninges is a layer of three different tissues that surround the brain, and these include the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. Now the dura mater has extensions that help to divide the brain into hemispheres, and we'll take a look at those in a minute. What's important for you to realize here is that just like the spinal cord, the meninges of the brain help to surround it and help to protect it. Just like with the spinal cord, the outermost of the meninges is going to be the dura mater, which is tough fibrous connective tissue. Underneath that, we're going to find the arachnoid mater. And between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater, we find that subarachnoid space. And the subarachnoid space is where we find the cerebral spinal fluid. So as I said in the previous slide, the dura mater also helps to divide the brain into different regions. And so we have something called the Falx cerebri, and this is an extension of the dura mater, which helps to divide the cerebrum into left and right hemispheres, as you can see here. The next division is something called the tutorium cerebelli, and this helps to separate the cerebellum, which is located posteriorly, from the cerebrum. And finally, the Falx cerebelli helps to separate the cerebellum into cerebellar hemispheres. Again, because we can't see the cerebellum, you aren't able to see it on this slide. But we will take a look at all three of these structures in lab. So in the last couple slides, we talked about the meninges, which are a physical barrier which surrounds the brain and helps to protect it. Now we're going to talk about something which is more of a physiological barrier, but it's not something that you can lay your hands on or point to and say this is the blood-brain barrier. So the blood-brain barrier is a system that helps to protect the brain from pathogens and harmful substances by serving as a selectively permeable membrane that only lets some things from the bloodstream into the brain and not others.
and we discovered the blood-brain barrier over a hundred years ago when dyes were injected into live animals. And they would watch these dyes appear in each of the organs and tissues of the body. But when they did a necropsy on that animal after it died, they saw that none of the dye had been taken up in the brain or the spinal cord. And that led scientists to theorize that there was some barrier that was preventing this dye from making it from the bloodstream into the brain. And now we call that the blood-brain barrier. Now it's very important for you to realize that the blood-brain barrier is not a physically visible structure. The meninges are not the blood-brain barrier. But what the blood-brain barrier is, it's created through connections within the blood vessels of the brain and also the neuroglial cells. Normally the smallest blood vessels, which are called capillaries, are quite permeable, allowing substances to cross easily between the surrounding tissues and the bloodstream. But this is not the case in, inside the brain. We have very tight connections between the endothelial cells that make up the blood vessels. And as a result, only a few different types of things can cross from the bloodstream into the brain. And these are things such as fat soluble molecules. Also oxygen, carbon dioxide, any small nonpolar molecule can make it across fairly easily, as can many analgesics and anesthetic agents. Ions can also move across, but they tend to do so very slowly, and so we have a different ion concentration within the brain and cerebral spinal fluid than we would within the bloodstream. Now glucose, of course, is our major energy source, and it can move across, but we do so through the process of active transport. So what can't cross the blood-brain barrier? Well, there's a lot of things that can't cross. First of all, large proteins can't move at all. In fact, medium-sized proteins can't move either. And so this makes the composition of the cerebral spinal fluid in the brain very different from what's in the bloodstream. The other thing that doesn't cross are the metabolic wastes, such as urea, as well as most antibiotics. And this can be a problem because if we do get an infection in the brain, we have to be very selective of uh, the agents that we use to treat that infection because most antibiotics, for example, tetracycline, uh, aren't going to make it across that blood-brain barrier. Now, as we'll talk about in a few slides, the blood-brain barrier is incomplete, and there are also things that can make the blood-brain barrier temporarily more permeable. These include things like radiation, such as microwaves, uh, trauma to the brain, as in a traumatic brain injury, as well as hypertension and infection. So in some instances, the blood-brain barrier can break down and potentially allow things to move into the brain that we normally don't allow. So remember back to the meninges, we said that we have a special fluid called CSF or cerebral spinal fluid that's found within the subarachnoid space of the meninges. This is a clear liquid and we generate about 80 to 100 mils a day containing glucose, proteins, and also some select ions. It's produced in something called the choroid plexus, which is located deep inside the brain, inside the lateral ventricles. And so the functions of cerebral spinal fluid are many. First of all, it does offer some mechanical protection in the brain. It allows the brain to essentially float inside a pool of this cerebral spinal fluid and so gives it some weightlessness. It also softens the impact of the brain with the bony walls of the skull. So think about slamming on the brakes of your car and you lunge forward. Well, as you're lunging forward, your brain's also lunging forward. And without that cerebral spinal fluid, it would rattle around in your cranium, sort of like a nut in a shell. And obviously that wouldn't be very good. The other thing that the cerebral spinal fluid does is offer us some chemical protection. It has this optimal ionic concentration that allows for propagation of nerve impulses. If we didn't have this ion concentration, the nerve impulses could be interrupted or prevented altogether. And so ion concentration is extremely important inside the brain. And finally, the cerebral spinal fluid is important in the circulation of nutrients and waste products to and from the bloodstream. Within that subarachnoid space, not only do we have the cerebral spinal fluid, which by the way is created from blood, but we also have the major blood vessels that feed the brain with oxygen and nutrients. So not only do we find the cerebral spinal fluid within the subarachnoid space, but we also find it within the hollow cavities of the brain, which are called the ventricles. So the brain has two lateral ventricles, which are located in each cerebral hemisphere, and within those ventricles we find the choroid plexus. Remember the choroid plexus was the region made up of ependymal cells that helped to generate the cerebral spinal fluid from blood plasma. Now the fluid is created in the lateral ventricles and it will drain into something called the third ventricle. 
and from the third ventricle it will go down into the fourth ventricle which has openings or apertures to the outside that allow that fluid to move out and around the brain via the subarachnoid space. Now from the last picture you might be saying wow these ventricles are really large and they're not small but they're also not that big. So here is a nice frontal section of an actual human brain where you can see the left and right lateral ventricles as well as the third ventricle. So these are very small potential spaces. They contain just a little bit of the cerebral spinal fluid. So this slide just shows the flow of cerebral spinal fluid from the lateral ventricles where it's created into the subarachnoid space. So the fluid's created in the lateral ventricles, it moves downward into the third ventricle, and then the fourth ventricle, and finally it enters the subarachnoid space via the lateral and median apertures. Once in the subarachnoid space, it circulates, and arachnoid villa of the dura mater will reabsorb the cerebral spinal fluid and eventually put the excess back into the bloodstream. So the structures responsible for reabsorbing the cerebral spinal fluid and putting it back in the bloodstream are called the arachnoid villi. And so these are projections of the arachnoid mater that penetrate the superficial dura mater and extend into the dural venous sinus. And the rate of absorption of cerebral spinal fluid ideally should be the same as the rate of production, that is around 20 milliliters per an hour. Now, if the cerebral spinal fluid isn't absorbed as quickly as it's produced, we can get a condition called hydrocephalus, which literally means water on the brain. So hydrocephalus is an abnormal condition caused by the accumulation of cerebral spinal fluid within the ventricles and also within the subarachnoid space. And as this fluid builds up, it exerts pressure. And if we have an adult, that pressure can very quickly squeeze the brain and lead to irreparable brain damage and death. We typically find this, however, in neonates or newborns. We have a baby that's been born and it has a blockage of some of the vessels that drain that cerebral spinal fluid. But in a fetus, this is not immediately fatal because the bones of the cranium have not yet fused. Remember, we have those fontanelles, which are incomplete connections between the cranial bones. So instead, what happens is the head swells up and you look like this brainiac type thing. And so it is a very serious condition, but one which can be treated. And basically what they do is they will put a shunt in from the cranium to drain that fluid and they will drain that fluid uh, through a tube that extends down in the abdominal cavity. And so somebody with hydrocephalus, if they've been born that way, can be treated and live a normal life. The only thing they have to watch is to make sure that that tube doesn't become occluded because if it becomes occluded, then we have the same problem with hydrocephalus and fluid being exerted on the brain. So while we're on the topic of the cerebral spinal fluid and meninges, we should talk about a condition called meningitis. Remember, itis just means inflammation of, and so meningitis is an inflammation of the meninges, which may result in a very dangerous condition called encephalitis, that is swelling of the brain. Now, meningitis can be caused by a variety of different factors, including bacterial infection, a fungal infection, or even a viral infection and most often it's diagnosed by neurological signs, which you can see at the right, and also the examination of the cerebral spinal fluid. So symptoms of meningitis include things like, of course, a headache, uh, altered mental state. Uh, people typically are f afraid of light or don't like light, so we call that photophobia. And they also might have some stiffness and rigidity within the nuchal portion of the neck. If we look at their vital signs, people with meningitis oftentimes have a high fever, and in some types of meningitis we get characteristic blotches or petechiae within the skin and some of the mucous membranes. So as I said, there are several different types of agents that can cause meningitis. Probably one of the most dangerous of these agents would be bacterial meningitis. Um, bacterial meningitis spreads very easily between people, and the demographic that we're looking at tends to be adolescents to young adults. And so people in their college years are most at prone for several types of bacterial meningitis. There's been a recent outbreak at Princeton University, which has caused the USDA and FDA to actually bring in a vaccine that was produced in Europe uh, to inoculate the entire Princeton community because again if we have this demographic of students that are anywhere between 18 to 25 these are the prime targets for bacterial meningitis and bacterial meningitis can be very serious and lead to fatalities very quickly. If you've been watching the news last year, you're probably also aware of a multi-state outbreak of fungal meningitis, and this fungal meningitis was actually caused by contamination of a drug uh, that was produced by a compounding company that had spores of this fungus in there. And so far, this fungal meningitis has been very difficult to treat and has resulted in over 60 fatalities nationwide.
Okay, now we're going to go on to talk about the different regions of the brain. And unlike your textbook, which starts with the cerebrum, we're actually going to start with the brain stem, which is sort of the very primitive area of the brain. And the brain stem includes the medulla oblongata, the pons, and also the midbrain. And the brain stem, as I said, is very important in regulating automatic body functions. It's also the site where we have 10 of the 12 cranial nerves arising. And we'll talk more about the cranial nerves in the next lecture. So the first part of the brain stem is the medulla oblongata, or just medulla for short. And it has both white matter and gray matter. Remember that white matter contains the myelinated axons, whereas the gray matter contains the cell bodies and also the dendrites and synapses and so on. So within the white matter of the medulla, we find a couple of very important structures called the pyramids. The pyramids are also known as the corticospinal tract. And remember, a tract is essentially a nerve within the central nervous system. And a nerve, again, is a bundle of axons. So these pyramids are bundles of axons that move from the spinal cord to the higher regions of the brain. And that's why we call them the corticospinal tracts. Cortico, from going to the cortex, to spinal, going to the spinal cord. And so these help to route sensory and motor information to and from the spinal cord to the cerebral cortex. Now there's one very important feature of the pyramids uh, about midway down the medulla called the decussation of pyramids. And the decussation of pyramids is the area where these pyramid tracts actually cross over. And so as a result of this decussation of pyramids, the left side of the brain is actually sending and receiving input from the right side of the body, and the left side of the body is receiving input from the right side of the brain. Now the gray matter within the medulla includes several nuclei. Now here where I say nuclei, I don't mean uh, the thing in the middle of the cell that has a DNA. Instead, the definition of a nucleus that we use in the nervous system is a collection of neuron cell bodies that is found within the central nervous system. And so a nucleus uh, would be within the central nervous system, whereas a ganglion, remember, was a collection of cell bodies outside the central nervous system. And so there are three nuclei that are important within the medulla, including the olivary nucleus, the gracile nucleus, and the cuneate nucleus. There's also five cranial nerves that arise from the medulla oblongata. Now the main functions of the medulla oblongata are serving as the body's cardiovascular and respiratory control centers. As far as the cardiovascular center, the medulla helps to control our heart rate, and it also helps to control our blood pressure by controlling the contraction of smooth muscle within the blood vessels. Now as far as its respiratory functions, the nuclei of the medulla help to regulate the rhythmicity of the breathing reflex. And breathing is one of those weird reflexes that can be consciously controlled, but automatically controlled as well. And so the breathing rate tends to be set based on the amount of exercise, but also the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the bloodstream. The medulla is also important as sort of a switchboard, which helps to send information in and out of the cerebellum. We'll see in a few slides, the cerebellum is very important for coordination. And finally, the medulla is also the reflex center for coughing, sneezing, swallowing, and also hiccuping. Located just superior to the medulla oblongata is something called the pons, and the word pons here means bridge. Now the pons contains the nuclei for several different cranial nerves, including the trigeminal nerve, the abducens nerve, the vestibulocochlear nerve, and the facial nerve. We'll learn about the functions of these nerves in the next lecture. So remember I said that the word pons actually means bridge, and this is very apropos because the pons helps to connect the spinal cord with the cerebral cortex and also links the cerebral cortex to the cerebellum. So it relays nerve impulses related to voluntary skeletal muscle contraction to and from the cerebral cortex and the cerebellum. It also contains the pneumotaxic and eight-neustic areas which help to control respiration along with the medulla oblongata. So when you think respiration, think medulla oblongata primary, but pons is secondary, because both of them help to regulate our depth and rate of breathing. The third part of our brain stem is called the midbrain, and the midbrain is a very small piece of tissue that's located superior to the pons. It's only about an inch in length, and it helps to connect the pons to the diencephalon. The diencephalon includes things like the thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus. Now within the midbrain, we're going to find something called the cerebral aqueduct. Remember, the cerebral aqueduct was a passageway for cerebral spinal fluid from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. Structures of note within the midbrain include the cerebral peduncles, the corpora quadrigemina, the substantia nigra, and also the red nuclei.
the midbrain is also the place where cranial nerves 3 and 4 arise. So let's take a look at some of that key anatomy that I mentioned in the previous slide. What you see here is actually a transverse section through the midbrain. And the first anatomy that I want to point out are the cerebral peduncles. The cerebral peduncles are clusters of motor and sensory axons which help conduct nerve impulses from the cerebrum to the spinal cord. The next anatomical feature is a nucleus called the substantia nigra. Now substantia nigra literally means black matter and this is an area of lots of cell bodies and lots of pigment and the pigment here is actually the neurotransmitter dopamine. And this area helps to control subconscious muscle activity much like the basal nuclei that we'll talk about in a few slides. And finally deep to the substantia nigra we find something else called the red nucleus. The red nucleus is red because it's very vascularized, contains a lot of blood vessels and blood flow. And this is also a nucleus of cell bodies that helps with the coordination of muscle movements. The last feature that I want to mention are the corpora quadrigemina. This literally means the four bumps or four bodies, and I like to think of them as the four butt cheeks, because if you look at them in an actual sheep brain or human brain, they actually look like four butt cheeks. Okay, so the corpora quadrigemina consists of two different sets of colliculi. The superior colliculi are reflex centers for eye movement. That is, these are the areas of the brain that control that involuntary visual tracking reflex that happens when the higher brain centers are not engaged. Below the superior colliculi, we see the inferior colliculi. And the inferior colliculi help to coordinate head movements with auditory stimuli. Specifically, they direct our startle reflex. So if you're walking down the street and all of a sudden a car backfires, First of all, it's going to scare you, but in the process of scaring you, you'll also notice that you turn towards the source of that sound, and that's called the startle reflex, and that is caused by our inferior colliculi. So here's just a posterior view to the brain with the cerebellum sort of reflected backwards so we can see parts of the midbrain. Remember, the midbrain consists of a lot of different structures, including the superior colliculi, which are the visual tracking centers, and also the inferior colliculi, which helped with that startle response. Now between the cerebrum and the brain stem, we also find two functional brain centers. I call them functional brain centers because we can't actually point to them and identify them uh, on a section of a brain. And that's because their nuclei are scattered throughout several different brain regions, including the pons, uh, medulla, midbrain, and other regions of the brain. Now the reticular formation includes something called the reticular activating system. And the reticular system has a few different functions. First of these is that it helps to filter the incoming sensory info. There's a lot of information that's flooding into the brain at any one time. Think about all the somatosensory receptors throughout your skin, all over your body, your visual receptors located in your eyes, auditory receptors located in your ears, and then your vestibular receptors located in your inner ear. So all this information is literally flooding into the central nervous system, and it would just be overwhelming to process all this information at once. And so what the reticular formation does is it helps to filter the information and only bring essential information to the cerebral cortex where it is processed. And so if we have a stimulus that is constant, we tend to filter that out. For example, think about the watch on your wrist if you're wearing watch or any jewelry you might be wearing. Now after you have this jewelry or your watch on for a few minutes you tend not to be aware of it at all unless that jewelry or the watch moves around. And so you're not thinking about your watch band encircling your wrist but if that watch band were to snap and break man you would be aware of it. And so the reticular system helps to filter the incoming sensory data and only alerts the cerebral cortex when there's been a relevant change in stimulus. For example a couple years ago I was lying in bed dead asleep and all of a sudden I woke up and knew that the power had gone off. And the only reason I knew the power had gone off is because I could see the alarm clock blinking. But I thought, why did I just wake up? You know, the alarm clock doesn't make any noise when it goes off. And what had happened is when the power had gone off, the air conditioning had also gone off. And even though the room hadn't had time to warm back up, uh, what had happened is my brain had become aware that that sound of the air conditioner had abruptly stopped. And so the reticular activating system alerted my cortex and said, hey, something's changed. And so another job of the reticular system is to alert the cerebral cortex when there's been a change in the stimulus. And finally, the last function of the reticular formation is to maintain consciousness and alertness of the cerebral cortex. And so if you're sitting in class and starting to drift off to sleep or just into unconsciousness, uh, that's because your reticular activating system isn't adequately stimulating your cerebral cortex.
But again, if I were to drop a book or make a loud noise, all of a sudden you would become more alert and awake, if only for a few minutes. And so when we have people that have brain damage that causes them to black out or even go into a coma, oftentimes that's because the reticular formation has been damaged. Now one last point about the reticular formation, it also has some motor functions. Specifically, it helps to generate muscle tone by generating periodic motor nerve impulses to cause minuscule contractions of our skeletal muscles. Another functional brain region that we find uh, between the brain stem and the cerebrum is called the limbic system. The limbic system encircles the brain stem and also a structure called the corpus callosum, which we'll see in a few slides. And important parts here include the hippocampus nucleus and also the amygdala. The hippocampus is extremely important for making long-term memories, and the amygdala is important for fear and other strong emotions. And so essentially, our limbic system is the emotional brain. It helps to attach emotion to incoming stimulus. So things like intense pleasure, pain, and rage are all functions of our limbic system. The limbic system, along with the epithalamus, is also important in eliciting smell memories, which we'll talk about in a slide or two. Now you might be wondering, why do we have emotions? Well, emotions are important for giving meaning to incoming sensory input. For example, if you watch a sad movie, emotions help you to internalize that information and realize that, oh gosh, somebody died. That's really unfortunate. That's really sad. The other thing that emotions help us to do is make stronger memories. And so if you've ever had something traumatic happen to you in your life, chances are you're going to remember that for a very long time because that traumatic emotion helps to more efficiently create memories. Okay, so the reticular formation and also the limbic system were functional regions of the brain that we can't really point to. Uh, now we're going to go back to some concrete anatomy that we can actually identify through dissection. And the first of these is the cerebellum. The cerebellum are very conspicuous hemispheres that are located in the posterior part of the brain. So here we can see an inferior view of the brain showing the cerebellum, which is highlighted in orange. You can see the left and right cerebellar hemispheres and then a constrictor in between them called the vermis. And the vermis just means worm because if you look at it very closely, it does look like a worm, kind of freaky. And so the cerebellum is partially separated from the cerebrum by an extension of the dura mater called the tutorium cerebelli. Again, we'll take a look at this in the laboratory course. So in this slide, we're looking at a mid-sagittal section through the cerebellum. And the cerebellum, to me, kind of looks like a cross-section of broccoli. There's sort of like a leafy area and also a stem area. And the stem area here is called the arbor vitae. Literally, it means the tree of life, and it consists of white matter, that is, myelinated axons. External to that white matter, we find the folia. And folia here means leaves because these are little clusters of cell bodies that tend to be grouped into little clusters that actually look like leaves. And of course, within the cerebellum, we have the fourth ventricle and cerebral aqueduct, both of which are important in the transport of cerebral spinal fluid. Now, one of the main functions of the cerebellum is to ensure the coordination of muscle movements. Now, when we think about skeletal muscle, remember that skeletal muscle is actually consciously controlled by our cerebral cortex. And specifically, we'll learn in a few slides that the area where we plan muscle movement is in the premotor cortex. This is where we say, I'm going to pick up that pencil. Now, that information moves from the premotor cortex to the motor cortex, which actually generates the action potentials or nerve impulses that travel to the skeletal muscle. But the premotor cortex and motor cortex don't actually have a good idea of how contracted that skeletal muscle already is or what's the position of the joints at this time. And so the skeletal muscle and the tendons and ligaments have proprioceptors within them, that is sensory receptors, that generate action potentials through sensory neurons and that information travels back to the cerebellum. Now the cerebellum gets the information of what the current position of the limbs and the joints and the muscles are right now, and it also gets information from the cerebral cortex saying, well, this is what I want to do. And so what it does is it looks at those two different inputs and it makes adjustments. And so the cerebellum helps to correct the primary motor area to make sure that our muscle movement is coordinated and on spot with what we want to do. So if you want to demonstrate the coordinating function of the cerebellum, you can do any of the simple sobriety tests that a police officer would do with somebody suspected of drunken driving. You know, just closing your eyes and then extending your finger and touching your nose is something you cannot do without a cerebellum.
but as it turns out, the cerebellum is actually the first region of the brain to be impaired when we take alcohol or illicit drugs. And as a result, we become less coordinated, our actual muscle movements become disconnected from our intended muscle movements, and we can get something called ataxia, you know, just staggering around. So staggering, again, can be caused by too much alcohol, but it can also be caused by damage to the cerebellum or other areas in the brain that are involved in voluntary skeletal muscle contraction. Now, the cerebellum is also an important storage center for repeated muscle movements. If you are a pitcher, for example, in a Major League Baseball game, uh, chances are you've thrown tens of thousands of pitch in your lifetime, and as a result, you become very good at it, and that pitch becomes essentially reflexive. A major league pitcher can throw the same pitch again and again and again because the sequence of nerve impulses that directs this complex suite of muscle movement is actually stored in part within the cerebellum. And finally, we think the cerebellum may also be important in emotion, language processing, and also cognition or higher thinking. Okay, the next brain region is called the diencephalon. The diencephalon surrounds the third ventricle, which is shown here, and extends from the brain stem to the cerebrum. The diencephalon can be divided into three different structures, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. Okay, the first part of the diencephalon is called the thalamus. The thalamus is located superior to the midbrain and inferior to the corpus callosum. And the thalamus has one main function, and that is it serves as a relay station for sensory and motor impulses to and from the cerebral cortex. So you can think of it as a giant switchboard. And unlike the other lower brain regions, the thalamus actually does register a crude recognition of certain types of sensory input, for example, pain, temperature, and pressure. However, it does not fully process these data, and so when these stimuli do reach the thalamus, we become partially aware of them, but we're not able to localize them on the body. For example, if you were to slam your right thumb with a hammer, your thalamus would partially make you aware of that pain, but until that information actually reached the cerebral cortex, you wouldn't be aware of what area of the body is actually in pain. Now the other thing the thalamus does is it plays an essential role in awareness and also cognition, which is the acquisition of knowledge. Now inferior to the thalamus is the hypothalamus. Remember hypo here just means below, and so the hypothalamus is the area below the thalamus. It's a very small, insignificant looking region of the brain, but it's so important. And some of the functions of the hypothalamus include controlling the autonomic nervous system. So all of the viscera and all of the involuntary effectors in your body are controlled by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is also the control center for much of the endocrine system. It produces a several hormones. It also controls the pituitary gland or master gland, which in itself secretes a lot of different hormones. The hypothalamus is important in initiating visceral responses to emotion. So it's tied in, in a way, into the limbic system. For example, let's say that you're watching a scary movie and all of a sudden the antagonist jumps out from behind a couch with a butcher knife. Uh, if you're really into that movie, your respiration rate will speed up. Your heart rate will speed up and begin pounding. And that's because your hypothalamus helps to coordinate the action of your visceral effectors, your heart, uh, your respiratory system, and so on, with your actual emotions. The hypothalamus is also our satiety center, that is, it tends to regulate how much we eat, when we're hungry, when we're full. It also regulates our thirst or drinking reflex. The hypothalamus, in part, also controls our sex drive, which is pretty important too, and it also controls our body temperature. And finally, the last major function of the hypothalamus is to help control our circadian rhythms, that is, our wake-sleep cycles. Now, there's several regions of the brain that participate in circadian rhythms. One of them we'll learn about in the next slide is the epithalamus, but the epithalamus, the hypothalamus, and also the reticular system uh, together help to regulate when we're sleepy and when we're awake. So I tell students every year, if you're taking the final exam and you get to a question and it says, which region of the brain does X, Y, or Z, and you don't know the answer at all, if one of those answers is hypothalamus, uh, statistically speaking, you should probably choose it because the hypothalamus has so many different functions. Very, very important region of the brain. If you don't know the answer, it's probably hypothalamus.
Okay, this is the same slide I showed a few slides back, and it shows principally the colliculi of the midbrain, but also just above that we can see the pineal gland. Remember the pineal gland is the structure that secretes melatonin and also is part of our epithalamus. Now we need to talk about something called the circumventricular organs. The ventricles again were those hollow spaces uh, inside the brain. The largest ventricles were our left and right lateral ventricles. Now surrounding that we have organs such as the hypothalamus, the pineal gland, and even the pituitary that basically have a breakdown in the blood-brain barrier. Remember the blood-brain barrier was there to protect the brain from uh, pathogens moving from the bloodstream into the brain and also to keep the ion concentration correct. However, we do have intentional breaks in that blood-brain barrier within our circumventricular organs. And the reason is, is that many of these organs are monitoring the blood. For example, the hypothalamus is monitoring the osmolality of the blood, the saltiness, to determine when we should drink or when we should be thirsty. And it couldn't do that if it didn't have complete access to the bloodstream. And so these breaches in the blood-brain barrier are intentional. They're there so we can monitor what's going on in the bloodstream, but they can also be sort of areas where bacteria and viruses and whatnot can actually make it into the brain through the break in the blood-brain barrier. Okay, now that we've talked about the lower brain regions, we're going to go on and talk about the cerebrum. The cerebrum is the largest part of the brain in the human being. And the cerebrum is separated into left and right hemispheres, or half spheres, by something called the longitudinal fissure, seen here. Now, it's important to realize that the hemispheres aren't completely separated. They actually have white matter tracts called the corpus callosum, which allow the left brain to communicate with the right brain. And as you're probably aware, the cerebrum or cerebral cortex is a seat of intelligence. It functions for communication, uh, for processing sensory input, for generating motor output, and it's also the site of personality, intellect, and so on. And so your thinking brain is your cerebral cortex. Now, one of the questions I frequently get is, why does our brain look like macaroni? And the part of the brain that looks like macaroni is the cerebrum. And the reason is, is that in an embryo, we have a sort of primitive brain that has both white matter and gray matter. Remember, white matter is just myelinated axons, whereas the gray matter are the cell bodies, the dendrites, uh, the synapses between cell bodies, and also some unmyelinated axons. Well, as this embryonic brain grows within the embryo and later in the fetus, the gray matter grows more quickly than the white matter. As a result, it gets all bunched up so that we have uh, peaks and valleys in the gray matter. And those peaks are called gyri, which is plural, or a gyrus, which is singular. So a gyrus is a peak in the cerebral cortex. On the other hand, a sulcus is a narrow depression in between adjacent gyri. So the bumps or the noodles are called the gyrus, and the spaces between the noodles is called a sulcus. So let's take a look at the distribution of gray matter and white matter within the cerebrum. Now remember back to the spinal cord, where do we have gray matter and where do we have white matter? Well, in the spinal cord, we had white matter on the outside, and we had an H-like structure on the inside that contained the gray matter. Well, the brain is a little bit different we actually have the gray matter on the outside located in something called the cerebral cortex. So the cortex is just the outer part of any organ, and the cortex here contains all the cell bodies. And so the cerebral cortex is literally where all the neuron connections and cell bodies are located, and it's a very thin area of the brain located just underneath the pia mater. On the other hand, the deeper regions of the brain contain primarily white matter, just myelinated axons, which are transmitting information from different parts of the brain, from the brain to the spinal cord, and so on. But if we go even deeper within the cerebrum, we'll see something called the basal ganglia, or probably better called the basal nuclei. These are collections of cell bodies within the central nervous system, and as we'll see, they're important in the contraction of skeletal muscle. So the cerebrum is divided into left and right hemispheres, and each one of these hemispheres is divided into lobes. And the names of the lobes actually come from the names of the bones which overlie them. For example, underneath the frontal bone, we'll find the frontal lobe. And underneath the parietal bone, we find the parietal lobe. And underneath the occipital bone, we find the occipital lobe. And look at the temporal lobe. Which bone do you think overlies that? That's right, the temporal bone. And so we can see four lobes on the outside, and then buried deep to these lobes is another internal lobe called the insula.
in order to see the insula, we actually have to remove the temporal lobe. And so you can see the insula is a relatively small portion of the cerebrum that is located deep to the frontal and parietal lobes and medial to the temporal lobe. Now before we go on to take a look at the functional regions of the cerebral cortex and basal nuclei, we're going to take a look at the distribution of white matter within the cerebrum. And so white matter, remember, contains the myelinated axons, and here they're running in three different directions. And depending on which direction these fibers are running, we will name these fibers or tracks different names. And so association tracks help to connect GRE in the same hemisphere. For example, a gyrus here could talk to a gyrus here through association tracks. On the other hand, commissural tracks help to connect GRE in opposite hemispheres. For example, this gyrus in the left hemisphere could talk to this gyrus in the right hemisphere via a commissural tract. And finally, projection tracts, which are not shown here, help to transmit impulses from the cerebral cortex to other regions of the brain and also the spinal cord. So here is a mid-sagittal section through the brain. You're just seeing the left hemisphere, and we've prepared this brain in a special way that allows you to see the actual tracks. And so we can see that projection tracks allow the gyrus uh, in one hemisphere to talk to the spinal cord in lower regions of the brain. So information tends to go from up to down or down to up. On the other hand, association tracks allow one gyrus to talk to another gyrus in the same hemisphere using these sort of horizontal tracks. And finally, commissural tracks allow the left hemisphere to talk to the right hemisphere. The commissural tract you can see here is the corpus callosum, and it's actually been cut. So here we can see a frontal section of the brain showing the left and right hemispheres, as well as the corpus callosum shown in orange, which unites them. So the corpus callosum is the largest bundle of commissural tracts in the brain, and it's extremely important because it allows the left hemisphere of the cerebrum to talk to the right hemisphere of the cerebrum. And this is really important because you probably already know that the right hemisphere of your brain controls the left side of your body and vice versa. Uh, in some cases, it has been necessary to actually go in and surgically cut the corpus callosum. Usually, if we have somebody with untreatable epileptic seizures that haven't responded to any other type of therapy, one of the last resorts is actually to go in and sever these commissural tracts. And when we do that, oftentimes the seizures go away, but it also results in some very peculiar ways in which sensory information is processed in the left and right-hand side of the brain. If you'd like to see a video of somebody that has actually had this procedure done, please click on the link below. So now that we've gone through the white matter in the cerebrum, we're going to talk about some of the gray matter. We're going to start out with something called the basal nuclei. Remember, the basal nuclei are clusters of cell bodies deep inside the cerebrum. That is, these are not the ones on the surface, which are the cortex, but instead these are buried deep to the white matter, and they're located actually closer to the diencephalon. And so the basal nuclei communicate with the motor regions of the cerebral cortex and also with the red nucleus and substantia nigra of the midbrain. And together with the midbrain, the basal nuclei are important in monitoring and controlling subconscious muscular movements. They help to initiate and stop motor movements very, very cleanly. So when you go to pick up a pencil and then set it back down, uh, those movements are actually dictated by your cortex. But what the basal nuclei help us do is turn the muscles on and turn the muscles off. And we can see that when we have damage to the basal nuclei or to the midbrain, we get a sort of jittery muscle movement, as in Parkinson's disease. And so examples of reflexes that are initiated through the basal nuclei are the swinging of the arms. If you start to walk very slowly, you don't swing your arms, but you start to walk three, four miles an hour, you'll notice that your arms automatically swing at your sides, and the reason they do that is to help counterbalance you as you walk. And so the nerve impulses necessary to cause that arm swing initiate from your basal nuclei. The basal nuclei are also responsible for spontaneous laughter. Now, Parkinson's disease results when we have a degeneration of the neurons which connect the midbrain and the basal nuclei. Both regions of the brain were important in starting and stopping muscle movement. And when the connection between these regions of the brain is destroyed, what we tend to get is a very jerky muscle movement. We get sort of a palsy and uh, continuous contraction of these muscles. Now, initially, these symptoms can be treated with an analog of dopamine called L-DOPA. But as we have more and more and more of these neurons die off, the symptoms begin to reappear, and they don't respond to L-DOPA treatment any further.
Okay, now we're going to go on to the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex was that area of gray matter just on the outside of the cerebrum. And it's only about an eighth of an inch thick, and it's very superficial, but it's extremely important to all of our higher brain functions. And so each cerebral hemisphere is divided into three or four different regions of gray matter. And these include sensory areas. Now, the sensory areas receive sensory input, let's say from the eyes or the ears or the nose, and this is the area where we process that input. We also have motor areas. Motor areas are the areas of the brain that initiate voluntary contraction of skeletal muscle. We want to pick up the pen or the beer or whatever it is, and those motor impulses initiate from the motor areas of our cortex. And finally, we have something called association areas. Association areas are areas where we do the higher processing, analysis, and interpretation of a stimulus. So before we go on to talk about the different functional regions of the cerebral cortex, we need to say something more about the anatomy. If you remember back a few slides, you should recall that the cortex is divided into lobes. But what you may not know is that each lobe is also divided into smaller structures which are called gyri or a gyrus. As it turns out, our motor, integrative, and sensory abilities are not spread out evenly throughout the cortex, but tend to be isolated to a particular gyrus or portion of a cerebral lobe. For example, the primary motor area, which executes voluntary muscle contraction, is located in the precentral gyrus, just anterior to the central sulcus. On the other hand, the primary visual area, which processes sensory information from the eyes, is located in the very posterior part of the occipital lobe. So in the coming slides, we're going to go through the functions of each of these regions. However, it is also important that you learn the relative location of each region in the cortex. This is especially true if you're taking the laboratory class. So do yourself a favor right now and stop the presentation and print out a large copy of this slide so you'll be able to visualize the location of each area as we go through the presentation. So we're going to start out first with the motor regions of the brain. And the first of these is called the primary motor area. The primary motor area directs voluntary contraction of skeletal muscle. It's located in the precentral gyrus, and as it turns out, the gyri in the primary motor area are mapped specifically to different body regions, and this process is called somatotopy, and we'll see in the next slide an example. Now, it's important to realize that each muscle of the body is not innervated the same. We have some muscles, for example, in the hands that receive a greater amount of cortical area devoted to controlling those muscles. So areas of the body where we do very fine, skilled muscle movements have more brain running those muscles. On the other hand, if we take a look at areas of the body, for example, the quadriceps muscle, uh, that even though it's a very large muscle, it has proportionally a smaller amount of brain that's controlling it because it doesn't really execute that many different types of muscle movement and contraction. So this picture just shows a frontal section through the primary motor area located in the right cerebral hemisphere. And what you can see is that we have a drawing that maps the different regions of the body that are controlled by different areas of the motor cortex. Now, what you should notice here is that we have proportionally larger amounts of brain that are controlling the muscles of speech and vocalization, and also controlling the muscles of the fingers and the hands. In comparison, we have a lot less cortical area that's controlling other areas of the body, for example, the feet, the legs, and so on. Now, adjacent to the motor cortex, we also have something called the premotor cortex. And so the premotor cortex is located just anterior to the primary motor cortex. And the function of the premotor area or premotor cortex is to plan skilled muscle movements. For example, if I am a skateboarder and I want to jump over something, I'm going to think about what I want to do before I actually do it. And this thinking and planning goes on in the premotor cortex. Now, once you have thought things through, the information from the premotor cortex will be routed to the primary motor cortex, and the primary motor cortex will then direct the contraction of appropriate skeletal muscle fibers through motor neurons. Now, if you remember back to the beginning of the lecture, you should remember that the cerebellum has a very essential role in ensuring that the actual muscle movements fall as close as possible to the planned muscle movements. And so the cerebellum receives sensory input 
from proprioceptors, which are sense receptors located in the muscles, in the tendons, and in the joints, and it compares that sensory input to the message that the primary motor cortex is sending to the skeletal muscles. So essentially it has a map of what the nervous system wants to do and what it's actually doing. And so what the cerebellum helps us to do is it helps us to readjust our muscle contractions so that our actual movements more closely match our intended movements. However, despite all the computational ability of both our cerebrum and cerebellum, our actual motor movements don't always completely coincide with our intended motor movements. And so somebody that was intending, let's say, to jump a park bench with their skateboard could very easily end up on their butt particularly if this skill is not something they practice very frequently. Because remember, the cerebellum gets better at regulating or overseeing muscle movements if it's something that's done again and again and again. And that's where practice comes in. Our next motor area is something called Broca's motor area, or Broca's speech area. And as the name implies, the Broca's area allows the articulation and planning of speech. In most cases, it tends to be located in the left cerebral hemisphere. And so people that have damage to this hemisphere, let's say through a stroke, oftentimes will no longer be able to speak. Located adjacent to the prefrontal cortex is another motor region called the frontal eye field. The frontal eye field controls the voluntary movements of the eyes by directing the contraction of skeletal muscles that control the eyes. Now we're going to go take a look at the different sensory areas of the cerebral cortex. The first of these is called the primary somatosensory area, and this is located in the postcentral gyrus of the parietal lobe. The primary somatosensory cortex receives nerve impulses from our largest sense organ in the body, that is the skin. And so it receives information such as touch and also temperature from the special receptors that are located in the skin. And just like we saw with the motor cortex, the location of each of these touch receptors is mapped onto a particular region of the brain. So this picture just shows a map of the different regions of the body that are innervated by the somatosensory cortex. And what you can notice here is something similar to what you noticed a few slides back. That is, we allocate proportionally more brain area to sensory receptors in the face, in the tongue, in the larynx, and in the hands. And so these tend to be areas where we have lots and lots of sensory receptors, and we have very fine two-point discrimination. On the other hand, if we take a look at the legs, the elbows, the trunk, the rest of the body, we can see that we don't have near as much cortex dedicated to receiving sensory information from these regions of the body. Another very important sensory area is the primary visual cortex. The primary visual cortex receives sensory input from the eyes, and, it, and this information is processed in the posterior region of the occipital lobe. Now, as you can probably imagine, a lot of the sensory part of the brain is, in fact, devoted to vision. We are very visual areas, and as a result, the primary visual cortex is the largest sensory region of the cerebral cortex. Other sensory regions of the brain include the primary auditory cortex, which is located in the superior part of the temporal lobe. As the name implies, the primary auditory cortex receives information from the ears. Then we have the primary olfactory cortex. This is located in the medial aspect of the temporal lobe in a region called the piriform lobe. Again, as the name implies, the primary olfactory cortex receives sensory input from the nose, and the primary gustatory cortex receives information from the mouth and the tongue. So our taste buds report to our primary gustatory cortex. The primary gustatory cortex is located in the insula just deep to the temporal lobe. Also located within the insula is the vestibular cortex. The vestibular cortex receives information from the inner ear and allows us to perceive our orientation relative to gravity and also sense rotation and acceleration. And one of the things the vestibular cortex allows us to do is have a very good sense of balance. So here you can see somebody either standing on a balance beam. This would not be possible without the inner ear and also the amazing processing abilities of the vestibular cortex. Also located within the insula, just posterior to the gustatory cortex, is something called the visceral cortex. The visceral cortex receives sensory information from the organs, for example, the bladder and the stomach. So when all of a sudden you run to the bathroom because you really got to pee, that's because we have sensory neurons located within the urinary bladder that are sending information to the visceral cortex. We also have sensory neurons within the stomach and also the large and small intestine that allow us to know when our stomach is upset or when we might have a massive case of explosive diarrhea. So all this information is processed within the visceral cortex. So now that we've talked about the primary sensory areas, we also need to talk about the association areas. So the primary sensory area helps us to perceive a particular stimulus, but it doesn't help us to analyze or recognize it.
For example, if you're looking through the microscope and you see something that uh, is light, it's round, it has a dot, that sensory information is coming through the primary visual cortex. However, you don't actually come to recognize what you're looking at as a cell or another structure without your visual association cortex. And so the association areas help us to analyze and give meaning to the incoming stimulus. And if we have injury to an association area, we're still, still able to see or hear something, but we're not able to recognize it. And so recognition and interpretation is the job of the association cortex. So as you might imagine, each of the primary sensory cortices has an adjacent association cortex. For example, we have a somatosensory association area. This is an area that helps us to interpret the various touch and temperature data that are coming through our somatosensory cortex. And one of the things that the somatosensory association area helps us to do is to recognize things just based on touch alone. So if you've ever done that thing where you reach into your pocket or reach into your purse and you're like, what is that thing? I don't recognize it, but you feel it for a few more seconds and all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's a paper clip. Uh, it's because you have this association area in your brain that is able to form a visual picture based on what something feels like. Of course, we also have a visual association area. The visual association area processes the visual area that comes from the primary visual cortex, and it helps us to recognize, well, that's a dog, that's a cat, and so on. And we also have an auditory association area. You know, without that auditory association area, we might be aware that there's sound, but we wouldn't be able to recognize that sound as music or a particular type of music. Another association area is called Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area is linked to the primary auditory cortex and it's involved in the understanding of both written and spoken language. In addition to having an association area with each of the primary sensory areas, we also have something called a multimodal association area. A multimodal association area is an area of the brain that receives sensory input from multiple regions. For example, the posterior association area receives sensory information from the eyes, also from the ears, and also from the vestibular cortex. And so this area is very important for recognizing patterns. For example, being able to recognize somebody's face and put a name to it. Uh, it's also important in recognizing language. In fact, many authors place the Wernicke's area actually smack dab within the posterior association area. And finally, it's important for the orientation of self and space. So basically it helps us to generate a three-dimensional map uh, of the area around us based on what we've seen as we walk into a room. Another multimodal association area is the limbic association area. This helps to add emotional impact to particular stimuli. For example, if you're in a very sad movie and you begin to cry because somebody's died or something like that, uh, that's because your emotional brain, your limbic system, is assigning a particular emotion. And you'll probably remember that movie long after you've seen it because of the particular emotional impact. Another reason why the limbic association area is very important is because it helps us to recognize danger and initiate an appropriate motor response. For example, this guy looks up, he sees a grizzly bear that's running towards him. The appropriate response is to do what he's doing, throw your hands up in the air, run, and also scream. So all of these are very sort of automatic responses to danger. And people that have had damage to, let's say, the amygdala or other areas of the limbic system don't recognize danger and they also don't respond appropriately to it. And finally, probably the most important multimodal association area is something called the anterior association area, otherwise known as the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex contains all the qualities that make you, you. It contains your intellect, your ability to learn complex things, your working memory, your personality, judgment. All of this is located in a very small region of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. Now you might be wondering how we know which function is located to which region of the cortex. Nowadays we can easily identify which region of the brain is responsible for a given task by doing something called positron emission tomography. However, this technology is relatively new. Despite this, we have known about the functions of these different brain regions for over a hundred years. In most cases, early scientists or physicians learned the function of a particular brain region by studying what happened when the region was damaged through either accident or disease. Perhaps the best known of these case studies is the case of Phineas Gage. Now Phineas Gage was a construction foreman in the mid-1800s whose crew was tasked with blasting a roadbed for a new railroad line. So this process involved boring a hole in the bedrock, 
placing a powder charge and fuse in that hole, covering that charge with sand, and then tamping it down with an iron rod. Now ideally the charge would be ignited from a safe distance. On the day of September 13, 1848, Gage was out doing just that. He was tamping down a charge with a rod when it unexpectedly detonated. This transformed the three-foot iron rod into a projectile which shot through his left cheekbone and rocketed out the back of his head. Now Gage's crew, of course, thought he was a goner and were very surprised when, a few minutes later, he came around. They were even more surprised when he insisted on driving himself by wagon to the local sawbones or doctor. Now when Phineas got there, he reportedly told the doctor, this should be work enough for you, at which point the very astonished doctor began treating his patient. So as you might have guessed by now, Phineas survived his spectacular accident, at least for a few years. But what is more spectacular here are the changes that occurred in Phineas in the months and years following the accident. Now prior to the accident, Phineas had been a very hard-working, God-fearing type of gentleman who always had his eye on the future. After the injury, however, he became very prone to wild fits of rage in which he would spew forth the vilest type of profanity. He also became very impetuous and seemed unable to work for a delayed reward or plan for the future. So in other words, the injury to his brain, which was limited primarily to the frontal lobe, had drastically changed his personality. And so this was the first indication to medical science that personality, judgment, and intellect were located in the frontal lobe. So if you would like to learn more about the case of Phineas Gage, please click on the link below. So before we finish up talking about the frontal lobe, we should talk about the lobotomy. A lobotomy is a surgical procedure which involves the intentional severing of several of the tracts within the prefrontal cortex. And this was a surgical procedure that was used back in the 1950s, 1960s, previous to the invention of psychoactive drugs. And so it was used to treat a variety of neurological conditions, which included seizures, schizophrenia, sometimes depression, and in the very end, even behavioral disorders. And the person that probably popularized this procedure the most in the U.S. was Dr. Walter Friedman. So he was a neurologist that performed over 2,500 lobotomies between the years of 1945 and 1965. And here at the right you can see him performing what he called the ice pick lobotomy on a 12-year-old boy named Howard Dully. Uh, Howard was not there because he had seizures or because he had schizophrenia. He was brought in by a stepmom simply because he was sort of an unruly bad boy. And so Dr. Freeman went in with these ice picks uh, just above the eyes, uh, poked through the sphenoid bone, and moved those ice picks around enough to sever some of the tracks within the prefrontal cortex. Now, this is really horrifying to learn about today, but back in the 1950s, 1940s, eh, this is kind of accepted. So there's a really awesome radio story about Howard Dully and his lobotomy. So if you have a few minutes, please click on the link at the bottom of the page to listen to Howard Dully's story of his lobotomy. It only takes about 12 or 15 minutes to listen to, and it's a fascinating story. I should warn you that I like this story so much that I may very well uh, take a couple questions from this story and put them on your final exam. Now before we leave the cerebral cortex, I need to say something about hemispheric lateralization. We've talked about the left and right hemisphere so far as if they're equal, but in fact they're not equal. In most cases, people tend to have functional specializations localized either primarily or exclusively to one hemisphere of the brain, and we call this hemispheric lateralization. And it tends to be more pronounced in men than it does in women. Women, on the other hand, tend to have greater connections between the left and right brain. Uh, and so if they have damage to, let's say, one side of the brain, they're less likely to show defects as a result. Whereas if we have a male, let's say, that has damage to the left side of the brain, which controls language, then their ability to speak is probably going to be lost. Okay, the last part of your chapter uh, pertaining to the brain goes on to a lot of the higher brain functions. It talks about sleep and brain waves and memory and so forth. So the only one of these that we're going to talk about is memory. So memory is our ability to store and retrieve information. And it can be divided into short-term memory and long-term memory. Short-term memory is good for memorizing short little clippets of information and tends to be limited to data streams no greater than seven or eight pieces of information. And this is why it's easier to remember a seven-digit phone number than it is to remember an 18-digit phone number. On the other hand, long-term memory is essentially limitless in the number of characters or data packets that it can memorize. So it's fairly easy to form short-term memories, but most of our short-term memories will not become long-term memories.
So whether a short-term memory gets converted into a long-term memory depends on a few factors. First of all, our emotional state. If we're emotionally invested or aroused by a particular stimulus, we're more likely to remember it. For example, if you get attacked by somebody wielding a gun or a knife or something like that, you're more likely to remember the features of that person, their facial features, because it's an associated with a very powerful emotion. We also tend to learn things through rehearsal. That is, we repeat them again and again and again. So when you're trying to learn, for example, the sphenoid bone or the ethmoid bone, you just have to repeat and repeat and repeat. The other way that we learn things is through association. Think about uh, me as an instructor and how I have to learn the names of everybody that's in my class. And so oftentimes I'm really bad at this with my short-term memory and long-term memory. But what I usually do is have people take pictures. I look at the pictures. I try to pick out some physical feature of that person that somehow correlates with their name. And this is the process of association. And finally, it's important to remember that not all memory is created voluntarily, that we do have a lot of automatic memory going on. The example in your textbook they give is if you're trying to pay attention to, let's say, your instructor and the lecture that he or she is giving, you may very well not form any long-term memories from that lecture, but you may remember the fact that their fly was down or that they had a spot on their tie. So that's called automatic memory. So long-term memories can be divided into one of two categories, declarative memory or non-declarative memory. So declarative memory involves the intentional learning of names, dates, and other types of factual information. Declarative memories are usually formed consciously. That is, you look at a new coworker and you're like, think to yourself that name is Doug, 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 Doug. You, you repeat it and you intentionally commit it to memory. On the other hand, non-declarative memories can be formed either partially consciously or unconsciously. And they include things like procedural memory, such as skills, uh, motor memory, uh, which also involves muscle movement and emotional memory. So let's take a look at these steps and the parts of the brain that are responsible for forming a long-term declarative memory. Remember, declarative memory involves memorizing facts. For example, take a look at the picture at the upper right portion of the screen. You can see that we have part of the muscular system shown and that I have an arrow pointing to a particular muscle. So what muscle is that? Well, if you think back, you will remember that this is the latissimus dorsi. And memorizing that this muscle is the latissimus dorsi, again, is factual or declarative memory. The way that you remember that muscle was through repetition and maybe even association. Now let's take a look at the sequence of events that are involved in memorizing that information. So first of all, we have sensory information coming in from our eyes in the primary visual cortex. That goes to the visual association cortex and then to our multimodal cortexes. It will then travel to the hippocampus, which is located in the medial temporal lobe. The hippocampus is very important in forming long-term memories and the hippocampus communicates with both the thalamus and the prefrontal cortex via neurons that release acetylcholine. Now let's take a look at procedural memory. Procedural memory is not involved in memorizing facts, but instead is a type of motor memory we use to memorize certain types of skilled muscle movements. For example, think about being able to type on your keyboard of your computer. That's a learned procedural memory. So the structures here include the sensory cortex, that is the somatosensory cortex, as well as your eyes, the visual cortex. Each of these report to their respective association cortices and then to the multimodal association cortex. Now here this information is routed to our basal nuclei, which receive dopamine from our substantia nigra. From the basal nuclei, that information is routed to the thalamus and then the premotor cortex. The premotor cortex, as well as parts of the cerebellum, are the parts of the brain that are responsible for committing repetitive skilled muscle movements into memory. Okay, we're going to end out this lecture by talking briefly about some key diseases of the central nervous system. So diseases you should be familiar with include cerebral vascular accidents, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, cerebral palsy, spinal bifida, and also migraines and cluster migraines. Now each of these is located within your textbook. Uh, the only one that I'm going to talk about today are the cerebrovascular accidents or strokes. Okay, a CVA, otherwise known as a stroke, is the third leading cause of death here in North America. And strokes occur when blood circulation to the brain is blocked, which leads to something called ischemia. Ischemia causes hypoxia in all the tissues that have been denied blood. And without oxygen, these tissues are going to die off very, very quickly.
Now, if untreated strokes can, of course, lead to death, and at the very least, hemiplegia. Hemiplegia just means that we have one side of the body that has been paralyzed. Remember, the left side of the brain is in charge of the right side of the body, so if we get a paralysis on the right side of the body, it's usually caused by a stroke in the left brain. So signs of stroke include facial droop. Basically, they lose muscle tone in one side of their face. They'll also notice a difference in the bilateral strength of the left and right arms. The strength may be different in the left arm than the right arm, or the sensation might be different. And finally, speech is affected. People that are having a stroke oftentimes sound like they've had a couple too many drinks. But if they haven't been drinking and they exhibit other signs, such as the facial droop, these are all very diagnostic evidence that they may very well be having a stroke. So it's important to get a person that might be having a stroke to the hospital very quickly because nowadays there are some really good clot-busting drugs we can use to break up the clots and restore blood flow, but they have to be used very quickly in order to prevent permanent damage to the brain. Okay, you've reached the end of the lecture on the central nervous system and brain. As usual, we'll have a few review questions at the end of this lecture. Your performance on these review questions uh, won't be graded. However, if you do get less than 70%, I do suggest you go back, uh, watch this presentation again, and take some more detailed notes before you go on to take this week's Lalima quiz.